Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Pursuit of Ownership. This is one of your hosts, Clay Schwinke. And this week we have Matt Garino on. He's going to be talking about his journey into practice ownership. Hope you guys enjoy the interview. All right. We are here live at the Voices of Dentistry conference. This is Clay Schwinke, and this is the Pursuit of Ownership podcast. And today we have our very own Matt Garino. Matt? Happy to be here. I mean, this is... My first time in Voices of Dentistry, it's a lot to take in. There's podcasters everywhere. All the, all the dental beautiful people, they're here. <laughs> it's my first time as well, and it is, it is pretty surreal. It's actually my first time meeting Matt in person. It is. As well as George and Richard and Tyler. And Tyler. So in addition to being at Voices of Dentistry, we have our partners meeting we do every quarter. So we had that this morning. We had a great workshop. Um, Clay and Tyler were able to take part as well. It's my 30th birthday this weekend. A lot of, this is like a lot, a lot of big of milestones. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. If if you haven't heard about the Voices of Dentistry, uh, you should definitely look it up and try to come next year because it is a whole lot of fun. So today, I think we're going to be talking about Matt's journey and just kind of figuring out what his what his thoughts and feelings were pre-ownership, what he was looking for, uh, what, he ha- what he had in his mind, uh, you know, in looking for a dental practice, and then kind of give us an update on where you are now. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, George is very opinionated about his uh, love of group practice. And right. we, you know, we're inundated, inundated with that now, which I think is a good thing. Um, but in the reality of the situation, that's not most dentists out there. Most owners are a solo owner. Um, so it's important to, to speak to them and to provide a differing viewpoint and kind of why I went the more solo route versus buying a bigger group practice. Now, is this something you kind of had in your mind uh, throughout dental school? Um, kind of talk me through your, your, your kind of pathway into figuring out that this was kind of the, the way for you. Yeah, I think I always just wanted to be, at the end of the day, the guy, like the leader, the one, every... You know, big decision was made by me. Was, everything was ultimately my responsibility. You know, I, I didn't really want to share like clinical patients with, I just wanted to, to be my work and be my house. And uh, that's really exclusively what I looked for uh, in a practice. I looked for one that would, you know, were productive solo offices. We're doing over say 800,000 collections um, with a, an overhead in, you know, in check. Um, that I also felt that I could grow, that I felt that I could, you know, at the very least replicate what was, what was being done, bring on some new procedures, bring on a, you know, more of a, a go-getter attitude, um, and, and grow it to where, to, to new heights. Um, that's always kind of the lens I look for. Honestly, I never even considered a group. Maybe it wasn't as like, as known when I was looking or for whatever reason, I just always, that was always the route. It seems like it was it was internally that you had to look for that answer instead of yeah. instead of externally. So you kind of uh, kind of reflected back and really figured out, yeah, groups probably not for me. Yeah, I mean, because I'm I'm definitely an introvert. Uh, you can probably attest. Like I just you know, interacting with a lot of people over, especially a staff of a big staff, would be a lot for me. Um, even even now as it is, like. I need to like escape in my private office for a long time, like once every two hours. So <laughs> if I had like 15 staff members coming up to me with different issues, like that would just drive me up a wall. So I'm very happy staff of six or seven. I can handle that. Now you mentioned b- earlier about being able to reproduce kind of looking, looking at practices and, and being confident that you can reproduce and maybe even add on procedures uh, when you're looking at these practices you did a residency, correct? Right. What are your What are your thoughts on? Because there's probably a lot of dental students listening to this. Um, a residency, no residency. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you got to get your speed, however you can get it. Like whether your dental school is a good enough experience that you're able to get your speed in dental school, like comfortable with all the bread and butter procedures. Um, I wasn't able to get that in dental school, so I needed that residency to get my speed up to be just to be confident in like everyday stuff. And then like, I went into it very intentionally with wanting to learn specialty procedures that I knew would make my time in residency where I'm giving up you know, X amount of dollars in lost income uh, worth it. So I went in molar endo 
implants, extractions. I'm going to, I'm going to learn those, like whatever I have to do. Um, and that's what happened. And I was able to take those procedures and then bring them to my associate job after finishing residency and practice more there. And to the point where I was comfortable doing it with people that I was going to be seeing for the next 15, 20 years, you know? Um, so I would just think if, you, if you're considering it, just, just do some internal, you know, searching for where you are, how you feel your, your experience has been. And if there are any gap areas, does the residency make sense? I think for a lot of people it does. And it's, I think it makes sense, especially if you're going to be the one, the only one producing in that office, right? If you're going to be replacing that doctor and maybe he doesn't do extractions or maybe he doesn't do molar endo, um, the residency might make a lot of sense because that's where you can gain that, that clinical knowledge and, and the speed, like you said. Yeah. Like you just like doing as a solo, I'm going to speak just as a solo doc. Um, the higher value treatment you can do, the, the less kind of hard you'll have to work to make more money. And that's always attractive to me. Um, so I, you know, I, as I have, as I coach clients now who maybe don't do some specialty work, it is a hamstring, you know, it is, a, it does lower the ceiling a little bit as far as w the production they're able to, to get to. Um, so I think spending the time, however it is for a person, whether it's a residency, whether it's really doing CE aggressively at the beginning of a career, it, it just serves you very well to, to get into that soon. And especially being a solo owner. So after residency, you mentioned that you worked as an associate. Now, were you looking to own right out of the residency or were you just trying to find a job that you could kind of expand your skills and speed and then, and then you were looking for a practice? Kind of take us through that timeline and your thought process maybe towards the end of residency. Um, should I buy a practice or should I not? Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Uh, I was definitely looking. My, my goal was always I finished residency and I have the practice to buy and I just go right into it and I buy it. So I, I sent mailers right at the beginning of that year. I talked to brokers and banks throughout the whole year, like really trying to find someone. I got like this close to doing the breakaway affiliate program, which <laughs> looking back on it was one of the best things. Uh, Hunter Smith, thank you for saving me from that because I had like pen on the paper ready to go. <laughs> um, so no, I was really, I was really trying to find that right after I did not want to work for someone. Like I knew I would be a bad associate. Turns out I was a bad associate. <laughs> like I didn't need to like be in it to find that out. Um, so, but you know, as I went through that year, I got some responses from the mailer and met with people and was close on some, but just didn't feel right. A couple of them, like some red flags came up in the you know, when we really got in the financials, that just made me decide to walk away. Um, and so, gen generally, what were those red flags? Just so that somebody, mm -hmm. you know, listening to this, they're looking at practices. What are the major, major things that you kind of saw in your in your experience? Um, the first one I found, I really liked the guy. I loved the space. It was in the a type of town I wanted to live in. Um, everything fit. He was ready to retire in like six months or so. Um, I got his numbers. He was doing 900000 and then I got the deeper financial numbers and his overhead was just a mess. Like his staff percentage, I want to say it was like 35%. He had a high rent. Um, he just like at the end of his 900 was probably taking home 180. And you know, yeah. that asking price for that practice was probably going to be 750. So at the end of the day, after debt service, if I didn't raise anything, you know, I'm coming out like a very lowly paid associate. Right. And now with this, you know, with this risk added to it. So that one fell through. Another one I was deep into again. Um, this was issues with, uh, it was in a co-op building, which is very exclusive to kind of a New York thing. And there was a lot of red flags around that and like the process of getting into that, that I just made me like, all right, this is too much. Like, no. Right. Because um, I, I think that's a, a component that a lot of people don't think about is that if, if the practice owner doesn't own the building, there's a lease and a landlord. Uh, that's usually not too interested in uh, changing tenants, right? It's yeah, I it's mean, it's a big hurdle that a lot of people I don't think uh, think about at, at, in the beginning. Definitely, like the, I mean, I've talked about this before when I interviewed with Richard that how my landlords themselves delayed my sale three months, just them not liking me, wanting the owner to get a more experienced buyer. Um, it's really not something you think about. Like it just, I had no, I was like, oh, like I'm just going to take over the lease and you know, whatever. It's good. Uh, not the case. They have more power than you think. Yeah. Um, to this day, I pass them in the hall because they are in the same office building and I 
you know, give him a little uh, stink eye <laughs> or something. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's one of the things you don't think about. And I think like when you're looking at these practices to like stick to what, what seems right for you, there's a number or whatever red flag that comes up that doesn't feel right. There's other practices out there. It's it, looking back. I'm so happy. I walked away from those two that I was close to and found this one I'm in now because it's, it was the best thing for me. And I think that's a good point because I think people maybe have a scarcity mindset, right? And Okay, this this is the first practice that came up. Let's dig in. Okay, yeah, there might be some red flags, uh, and then you start bending on. Yeah, I could work with this, and we would have to make a lot of changes here. Mm-hmm. So, kind of talk about that fortitude that that you had to have, and 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 just kind of your thought process. Because I'm sure it, it's scary, you know, saying, "Hey, no, I'm I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to pursue this further." Uh, when there might not be another practice. I mean, I think if I, if I were in that situation, I would be feeling that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really is a tough, a tough thing to do because especially when you, you've now built a relationship with this seller, which happened. Um, and he kind of felt like he was a mentor to me and he wanted me to stake it over. And you, I mean, I've said this before, you got to do what's best for your life and it's your career and you get one of them. And this is the biggest decision you'll make in your career, at least the first part of it. And, you kind of can't get it wrong. Like yeah. you just, it's so important that do not screw this one up. It's either going to really set you up or really, you know, make your mountain to climb higher. Mm-hmm. Like, um, so stick to what you know, what you believe in, like use the professionals that you trust and that are going to support you either way. Um, and just kinda go with your gut, honestly. So how are you able to find, uh, these other practices, uh, you know, where you continually, uh, asking around, asking brokers, on market, off market. How are you finding these practices? Yeah, I, w- I was doing both off market and on market. Um, I sent out the mailers, probably sent out 300, maybe got like 15 responses, something like that. Um, now, were these practices that you had turned down, were those from those original mailers? You yes. Sent out? Two. So there was, the, there was the first one, yeah, the... Second one, he ended up choosing someone else. I was close to that one. And then the third one, a broker found me. And my eventual one I bought it was through a different broker. Okay. Um, I mean, I very much believe in if you're going to be looking for practices, like make it known to everyone. Like you're, don't be the best kept secret in town that you're trying to buy a practice. I want everyone to know. I want the banks, the brokers. Like, so when something comes up, they think of you. And like that happened to me. I where like a broker thought of me when something came up that he knew was in line with what I was looking for. Um, not the one I ended up buying, but you know, it's don't make it be a secret what you're looking for. How did you kind of network with those other professionals? It, were you just reaching out to them, uh, and how did that kind of go? How can someone who maybe hasn't wrote re- reached out to a broker uh, and is an associate somewhere, and they're like, I don't even know where to start, right? So, h- how did you reach out to those people? What kind of conversations did you have? Yeah. And like, this is not something that comes natural to me. Like, again, with the introverts thing, I don't, I don't enjoy reaching out to professionals and saying like, Hey, I'm looking for practice. Like, can you help me out here? Uh, so it can be done. I'm like to the listener, if you're not that type of person, like just push through that discomfort and it's worth it. Um, no, it was just cold call emailing or calling saying, you know, Hey, like, you know, giving a little intro. I'm in residency. I'm looking to buy practice at this amount of time. And they're always happy to get on the phone with you because at the end of the day, like you're, you're a customer for them. Like you're someone they'll present to a buyer and make a sale happen and they'll get a nice commission. So like, and like even more so bankers, like definitely would be, are willing to get on the phone. Everyone's willing to get on the phone with you. They want it. They want your business. So yeah. don't be afraid of it. That's what I'm saying. So once you eventually found this practice, how did you know that... Can I talk about your current practice that you, that you did buy? How, how did you know that that was the, that was the one? Um, the level of production he was doing at the overhead he was at, like it was very uncommon in my area. Like my area, which probably similar to a lot, is like the, the good practices are doing 850. The owner's taking home maybe 300 tops. Um, this was like almost double that. And like... I thought it was too good to be true. I was like, oh, this like this doesn't seem right. Like something's off here. So like I was like, all right. I told the broker I was interested. I met with the seller. And like he everything was like honest throughout the whole thing, even like getting into financials and digging through the due diligence and um 
you know, that was the biggest draw. The other, the other things were like, it was the number of ops I at least wanted. It was five ops. It was a bigger space. It was in a town I wanted. It was kind of a little bit away from a lot of the competition in my area, um, but it was still drivable to a, a, from a place that I wanted to live. Um, and like I liked his time frame. He was ready to go whenever I wanted him. Like he said, you want me to stay a year? You want me to stay a week? Whatever you want, I'll do it. And I was like, perfect, because I wanted him out as soon as possible. So... <laughs> Um, so it fit, that was fit. I mean, he said it. So I was like, all right, that's what he said. Um, and, uh, and, and like the, like the back to the level production, like he was doing a lot of production, but I knew from the ADA production by procedure report that he wasn't doing any codes that I didn't do and that I could just add on more to what he was doing. That was going to be my next question. So what, what kind of procedures was he doing? And now mind you, you've, you've done molar endo in this residency so you've kind of kind of set yourself up to succeed uh kind of going into a practice that maybe doesn't do that kind of stuff so what kind of stuff was he doing like crown and bridge fillings like one invisalign a month you know like nothing crazy like just a lot of crowns like he was you know looking in a hygiene visit just for what crowns he was going to do um and like you know, it's just sending everything out, like even like a, a, a patient in pain, antibiotics and, and go see the endodontist and see you later. Um, so that's like just like an, such an easy value add, like right off the bat. It seems like that, that's a lot of practices. Yeah. Uh, not even in New York, kind yeah. of throughout the U.S., right? Um, so as, as far as... Talk, talk to me about the process of, okay, I know this is the one. What do you do next? How, what, what do you even, who do you reach out to? Do you reach out to an accountant, a lawyer? Where'd you go from there? Yeah, so this, this is where the relationships you built serve you now. Okay, so you want to get everything ready that you find the practice. You can, you can just hit engage. You can like, you got your whole, all your soldiers and now you just say, hey, go, time to go. Um, so I had relationships with banks. Um, I had a relationship with an attorney. Um, I had a relationship with the CPA. The kind of the order that I like set all those in motion, it was definitely the bank first. You know, getting the financing in order was the biggest piece. You got to figure that one out right off the bat, obviously. Um, I put my offer in as I was leaving meeting him. It was actually my birthday three years ago, which, yeah, three years ago from today, pretty much. Um, met with him, was like having my wife drive home. And I emailed the broker being like, hey, whatever it takes, I want this practice. So got the financing piece going. We got the CPA engaged to do the due diligence. And then like once the offer is accepted, I went to the attorney. Um, those are the big three you need to get you need to get engaged. Two things. I think it sounds like you were you were able to do kind of multiple things on multiple fronts, right? You, could, you were able to walk and chew gum at the same time. I think a lot of people get stuck in, okay, this, then that, then this, then that. You can be doing multiple things, talking to brokers while also engaging with banks and maybe attorneys. So I think that's a good, good point is that you kind of have to facilitate all these relationships to kind of make everything work as quickly as you can. Because once you find that practice, that's netting a lot and you're able to add some value, you need to be able to, to use those relationships so that you can kind of get in there as quick as you can. Yeah, especially like an on-market practice like this was. Like, there's going to be other people right. looking at it. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to make the reason you didn't get it is because you couldn't get the financing quick enough. Like, yeah. you want to have someone, like I said, the relationship that knows you and that is ready to ready to be on your team when needed. And and something else too is that I want to point out is is that he's said no to three or four other practices. This practice that you know it might seem like a unicorn. But this is a normal practice. He's doing crown and bridge. That's netting. It's it's profitable. They're out there. Yeah. And I think the point is that you you have to know really what you want, and then just be be able to and have the fortitude to say no to things that don't kind of jive with what your vision is, and, and all that, and and what you're wanting for the practice. So yeah. I, yeah. I think like being being okay with taking risks is like been the 
if I could like think about one of the biggest things for my success is, is that is like being okay with being uncomfortable, being okay with taking big risks, like clinically on like taking out a big loan to buy this business. Um, you know, just investing myself, like as far as like CE or whatever, like taking, taking the big risk, it almost always pays off. Like if, if executed, it's just, it's, it's, it's always been worth it every time I've really gone for it. And even the risk of, of like you said, you, you're a little bit more introverted, even taking the risk of reaching out to people, right? Like that's yeah. obviously been, been fruitful for you, right. right? Like that's, there's a risk in everything. Uh, yeah, like even the, you know, the reason I'm a partner in Share Practices now is from Facebook posts that I just talked about my story, my journey. Like that was a small risk of like, okay, I'm just going to like open up what I'm up to and what what's going on, what's going well. And like, here I am kind of like just be out there. And that got that, noticed. That that was a risk. Yeah. You had to be vulnerable right. with a lot of people. So kind of talk about how you got involved a little bit more in Shared Practices. From those from yeah. those posts, right? right. Um, I always knew like my ultimate calling was helping Dennis in some way. I felt like I had something to say, something to offer, and like that I was I was always born to be a leader in the industry somehow, and I never knew what that looked like, and it was kind of frustrating to me um, that I couldn't see what it was. Um, so in that first year of ownership, I worked with a dental coach and. Um, I, I soon like realized I wanted that for myself. Like I love that relationship of like seeing someone through to their goals and really sticking their vision and like standing for that person in a way of like making them see what's possible. And I was like really, like I really love that, that relationship. So um, in February of last year, I started a life coaching training program, which is a bit different than the, the more consulting realm of dentistry. It's a lot more mindset work, a lot more personal development uh, area. Um, but I was, I was seeing like a need for some of that in the dental industry. Um, so as I started that program, they very much push you to like spread the word of coaching and and get out there and really be a coach. Um, and one of the ways that I kind of started doing that was like, Hey, let me just like put myself out there on this Facebook group. Like George had invited me to start to share my story along with some other people who did the same thing. Um, so he gave that avenue and I was like, all right, let me just see what happens. And that was the start of it. Nice. You took the risk of, of taking that opportunity and kind of seizing it. and Yeah. And then um, for whatever reason, it, it made some waves with the audience. It uh, got George and Rich's attention. Um, and then, you know, they approached me in April about, about coming on as a partner. Very nice. Yeah. So now talk about once you kind of got into ownership. What was that like? Uh, stressful, (laughs) uh, a lot going on at once, like getting things changed over, dealing with staff who are your, you know, you're now boss, you're now a leader. Like there's no hiding anymore. Like you're, you're the person in the practice. Um, everything like clinically with patients, that was all fine. Like the transition was, you know, that was not the hard part. Teeth or teeth. Yeah. Teeth or teeth. People are people like be a nice person, smile, acknowledge them. Like it's not, not rocket science. So were you worried about the differences between you and the seller and, and how that kind of transferred over? Because I think a lot of the times that's, that's a big, it's a big deal. You're, you're buying this practice that, uh, people have probably been there for a long time and the uncertainty of somebody new coming in, you know, how did you handle that, that transition? What was your transition like? Was it uh, a six month transition or was it like a, he stops on Friday, you start on Monday. It was, uh, he had his schedule and then he didn't schedule anything new, like restorative wise on his schedule. So we just condensed what he had. And he actually booked out pretty far, like six to eight weeks. He ended up staying about like seven weeks. Um, but just kind of condensing him started like three days a week and went down to like one, you know, kind of just, uh, finishing up his clinical stuff. And, um, that transition with staff, you know, I've talked about it. It was bad. It was, you know, staff quitting. Um, I really tried to, you know, rally the team around a kind of a new vision for the practice. They didn't take that well. Um, I mean, I just always felt like the own, the old owner ran the practice, such scarcity, such like uh, paranoia. Like he wouldn't let the staff know about anything. He would restrict their access on the computers. Like I just felt like I could do it better. Like whatever he did, like I have better ideas. I have better implementation. Like 
I'm going to, I'm going to do this better than he is. And, um, you know, maybe that some of that attitude came out and that was kind of the reason that people were a little bit, you know, pulling away from the start. I've definitely kind of realized that now looking back. Um, so the transition was, it was good and bad. You know, we definitely lost some patients. We definitely lost staff. Um, but we definitely came out better on the other end. Right. So that was a year and a half ago. Yeah. And the practice didn't go under. Yet, yet there was a lot of turnover in the beginning. So even if that does happen, I think that's a lot of people's fears of, of everyone's going to quit. They're not going to like my vision. Well, I mean, you've kind of proven that even if some of that does happen, it's still going to be okay. As long as, I mean, it sounds like you kept with that vision and, and you knew where you wanted to be and you had to rally and, and get people that, that agreed with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, a lot of that, a lot of that first year was just on me. Like it, it was an unsustainable pace to be like, you know, it all on myself. The practice depended on me being there producing, like getting the staff to all like, like interact normally with each other and not have been fighting. Um, and like now I know that's not a sustainable way to do it, but like I was willing to do that just to, to grow our numbers and make sure I was, you know, in a good place um, as far as the practice. Um, but now it's just like I have my team finally around me that is really my team, my people, our culture is so much better than before. We've gotten rid of like toxic personalities along the way. And um, I've really seen the value in now having like the right people. It's such a cliche. You hear it all the time. Like, you know, it's the, true. Yeah, it's the, you hear it all the time. I guess because it's true. So maybe I should just start listening to things I hear all the time. But <laughs> no, it it really is has shown this year with my new team. And I think that's something that if you if you are the solo practice owner, you you have to have that, and, and you have to outlast those toxic personalities. And they might be somebody that's pretty integral into the day to day operations of the practice. But if you have a vision and you know where you want to be and they don't compute with that, I mean, it, it's not going to work out. No. And I think just knowing like it's all going to be okay, even if you lose one of those perceived key team members that's been there forever, knows all the patients, like it's not going to fall apart. Like I, I couldn't hear that enough uh, when my original office manager quit and she was the one who had been there for 20 years, knew everyone. Like I was like, oh, sh- like it's going to fall apart. Like, um, and that's, I, a, that's a real worry. Yeah. You know, I mean, and you probably lost sleep over that. No, yeah. But like I had, I had my coach and my, and my side telling me like, listen, I've been through this. Like you're going to think this is the biggest thing in the world. It's really not like you're going to be fine. Like practice is just like you think about all the benefits of this person now not being there. Like that's going to far outweigh like some of her friends that might leave, leave the practice. Like, so like I had, you know, I, I invested in that be- for a lot for that reason, for someone to tell me like, Hey, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. That's as simple as that. You know? Yeah. I, I, I think being a solo, which I think there's a, most of the practices out there, one doctor practices, evident, you know, eventually there's going to be some change, uh, if they're being bought out by somebody else. I think that, that, knowing that there could be some weathering of the storm that you're going to have to do. But as long as you know and really know what you want internally and figuring that out, obviously it's been worth it. So kind of tell us where you, where you are now. How have you been an update, so to speak, yeah. from, from that, uh, you know, all, all that staff turmoil and, and turnover? Right? I, think, I think we're at a much more sustainable place than we've ever been. Like that first that first bit every like eight months in ownership was just a lot of work on myself. And, and I was, you know, definitely doing too much in a day, not delegating enough, putting it all on my shoulders, like really just micromanaging everything. Um, so now where we're at, we've, we have a staff that I delegate to all the time now that I deflect to them, that I really let them, I trust them, let them lead, let them really like impress me, which they do all the time. Um, We've grown into a two hygiene full time office now. We had always been a one hygiene. Um, we we grew the production to like a one point six five million in twenty nineteen. Uh, I was really proud about that. And you know, working fewer days than the old owner had, and he had had a part time associate. So you know, it's just me now and, and a Saturday associate. So 
Um, I'm just really like, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of bumps along the way. Like this wasn't, it wasn't a smooth 2019, but I feel like we're much more set up for a smooth 2020 than, than, you know, this past year. You almost had to kind of put the work in, you know, on the front and, and make sure that you were going to be set up for the long term and not just burn yourself out uh, trying to do all this dealing with toxic employees and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And I think like at one point, you know, I thought like a, a 10 year career was what I wanted. Like I, I just wanted to like get in there do do pretty well for 10 years and then be done. And that's it. And now like thinking about why I ever had that plan is just, it was just because I was perceived that I was going to be burnt out and not going to be um, like going to be done with everything by 10 years when, where I realize now that I could set my practice up where I, that feeling doesn't have to happen. I don't have to get burnt out in 10 years or 15 years. Like I can do this for as long as I want to and it feels good. And you know, that's kind of what I'm building this year is like something really sustainable and that doesn't tax me in the way it has before. So what kind of advice would you give somebody who is, you know, the, the group practice life, that's not for them. Uh, they want to they wanna be, she wants to run the show. Mm -hmm. She wants to be the boss. What kind of advice do you give to a solo, um, productive solo dentist who wants to make it sustainable? I think like solo dentists, we're doing a lot more dentistry than a group practice owner, like ourselves. Like we are in the chair a lot more time. So like really being solid with delegating, with taking as much like back office stuff off your plate that you can. So, you know, supplies, clinical notes, like just a time suck that you're better off either, you know, in the chair doing dentistry, being productive or, you know, working on more big picture items like vision for the practice, um, you know, leading the staff. Um, so just that like breakthrough and delegating, I think was the biggest thing for me because it's just, we are going to be in the chair more. It's just, it, just a, you know, function of the type of office that we've chosen. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt, appreciate you having you coming on here, uh, the pursuit of ownership. I think uh, a lot of our listeners are going to be the productive solo types. Yeah. And I think uh, hearing your voice and interviewing you has kind of given them a, a pretty good insight of, of what to expect uh, and, and also what kind of things to avoid and and uh, good advice. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Clay. We... we I love that we have a, a pre-owner show again. You know, we, we've been months without it and like we're really reconnecting with that audience again, which at the end of the day is always going to be our core audience. We're always speaking to the younger dentists. So the fact that they're now getting a dedicated day of the week and you're, you know, you, Tyler and Aaron are dropping some, some amazing knowledge on them is, is just awesome. Um, and for the listeners, like, please reach out with any questions. I'm, I'm very open to it. Matt at sharepraxis.com. Like, I, you know, I was, like I said in the interview, I was in, I was in your shoes of being afraid to reach out to people. And I don't want that. I don't want that for others. Like any question you have is not, there's nothing too dumb or, you know, small, just, just reach out. Perfect. Well, that should wrap up this interview. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me on Clay. Yeah. Take care. So what do you guys think of, uh, Matt's interview? Tyler, take it away. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. You know, I wanted us to get some more exposure from solo type docs, even though Matt is not exactly a solo doc anymore. I think all of them, all roads kind of lead to group ownership at Aaron. But um, anyway, you know, kind of get inside, <laughs> kind of get inside Matt's head and, and sort of the process that led to him being where he is was really interesting because I don't, you know, he's talked about it before, but kind of getting intimate about it and and talking about where he was pre-ownership is really important just to kind of understand, you know, who he was at that time and and have our listeners be able to question themselves and say, well, you know, am I a Matt? Am I a solo? Does that does some of this resonate with me? You know, hearing about his mindset, where he was uncomfortable at times, um, and most importantly, what his decision process was like along the way. Um, you know, he's the type of person that you know, we'll pull the trigger when it's time, but he was, you know, very um, discriminating with his opportunities and he understood the method and, you know, knew what he was looking for. And when it came along, he did pull the trigger, but there were a lot of, you know, false alarms that came along the way. And so just kind of hearing that narrative uh, was really important for me. Yeah, I think that was a really good point there um, about him actually saying 
no to a couple of opportunities. He actually decided that, hey, these are not going to work. And that bit of patience ended up paying dividends in the in the long run. Yeah, I think it's just important for, I, th- I think a lot of practice owners, it's a productive solo office, right? Most of them, most of them are going to be productive solos. So I think kind of peeling back the curtain a bit and kind of figuring out, oh, uh, you know, Matt has a lot of uh, bravado, right? But he's also an introvert. So, I mean, it, it took a lot of risk to kind of reach out and, and really flex his network of, like you said, brokers and lawyers, CPAs, just not, uh, he, he mentioned in the episode, not being the best kept secret, right? You should let everyone else know that you're uh, wanting to own a practice. And I think that's kind of what helped him too. Yeah, I think a lot of people can, and really Dennis in general, can kind of identify with that introvert slash trained extrovert identity. Um, him saying that, you know, after about two hours or so dealing with people, he kind of just wants to crawl back into his office and, and, and be on his own. And it made me really happy to hear that because, you know, I was worried that, you know, I, you know, I, I get that certain type of social exhaustion as well at times. And so to, to understand that, you know, he had to break through some barriers to, to position himself where he was and, and just go out there and said, Hey, um, he literally said, I'm looking for a practice. Can you help me to all these people? And, and I'm currently um, doing that myself. And it's not something I'm super comfortable doing, um, but it, it's a necessary, I, should, I shouldn't call it an evil, but it's a necessarily necessary barrier um, in its development that I think all of us really need to go through, you know, and, and reaching out to people that we don't necessarily know and just saying, hey, we need your help. Um, I need you to be a part of my team and, you know, keep an ear out for me and, and help me find an opportunity. And it's, it's important. A small little interesting thing that he said that I was surprised about where he said that he didn't feel that he got enough uh, clinical experience mm-hmm. in undergrad. And that so that's what made him actually want to do a residency. And that's the first time I've actually heard him say that because every time I think mm-hmm. about him, I think about him as having a very large clinical suite. And I kind of always assumed that uh, it was like that from the beginning. You know, I never realized that it started from such humble beginnings and then has... Uh, you know, made its way to what it is now. And I think he was pretty intentional uh, looking for that residency to expand his clinical skill sets. And I think that's anybody who's listening, if you're thinking about a residency, really kind of think about what you want to get out of it and, and be intentional with that year or two years um, of residency so you can expand that clinical suite so you can have a better, uh, basically a better outlook and, and a better way to look for practices. If you can produce more and have a better, better clinical suite, you can reproduce what the owner's doing. If he's doing some implants or some ortho or some endo, that can be kind of a, an ace in the back pocket. Yeah. I mean, I remember the first time that I talked to Matt, um, he gave me a call and he was just trying to get to know some of us. And I was kind of at a juncture where I was thinking about what I was going to be doing after graduation. And I asked him, you know, about his experiences and in residency and how necessary he felt that was. And I think that, you know, I remember him telling me that with what he's doing now, it was absolutely essential um, because of the sort of suite that he's trying to offer. Um, But he didn't necessarily elaborate, oh, you know, I I didn't think I got enough experience in undergrad and stuff. But what's, what's a really important takeaway is he knew what he was short on and he knew that the things that he was going to be doing there were going to suit the opportunity that that he was wanting to find. He was wanting to find one that didn't offer a whole lot in the way of implants and didn't offer the whole lot in the way of endo so that he could come in and and be value added. Um, And I I think that, you know, if you're considering residency, if you're considering even just like an associateship uh, prior to ownership, which, you know, I think we're strongly encouraging at this point, but um, you just have to have in mind, you know, what your weaknesses are, and what your strengths ultimately want to be. If you just want to get good, I, I think at one point he said, you know, whatever gets you fast at, at doing what you're doing is is good, like doing what you want to do. So maybe you just want to do Crown and Bridge and you want more exposure to that. You know, I've, I've seen people post on Facebook saying, you know, they're graduating with like four crowns, you know, probably not yeah. going to be up to speed clinically in, in a private practice setting. You know, yeah, maybe maybe some of that fear about going into that and going into ownership is kind of valid if you've only done four crowns. So maybe you should be right. looking for um, an opportunity that would give you, you know, a lot more exposure to, you know, more just bread and butter, crown and bridge. And so it's, you know, it, it, it's the point of not going haphazardly and saying, oh, I just did a residency. You know, 
that that's a whole separate topic in and of itself is figuring out you know what residency would suit that what opportunity would suit you and prepare you you know clinically uh, for what you're trying to do yeah yeah and i think that's it's a pretty personal decision right and i i talked to matt about it, it kind of comes internally it comes from internal so you have to figure out what do i want to do can a residency provide that can i get that out of private practice how can i set myself up for success in ownership moving forward so it's a personal thing and if you have any questions about that or if you want to ask matt any questions feel free to reach out to him or send him an email and we'll put that in the show notes if you have any questions for us uh, about if you should do a residency or not uh, we can try to help guide you uh, you can reach out to us and our email is going to be in the show notes that should uh, wrap up this week on another episode of the pursuit of ownership <laughs>